I'm Bill Dutton. I'm a professor of Internet Studies here at the OII. I guess more significantly, I'm one of three co-organizers of the Digital Innovation and Digital Scholarship Lecture Series. Uh, Christine Borgman and Sarah Thomas are also co-organizers with me of this series, and they'll be respondents today. But uh, it's really great to welcome you here. Um, I just wanted a quick uh, story, which I, w I was at a, a meeting uh, this month uh, with executives from Finland by, of, of any country uh, of, across a variety of industries, and I spoke to them in the morning, uh, but um, they had spent the day previously touring <coughs> Oxford, and uh, the, they were just struck by the fact that, and, and we might not notice it because we're in Oxford all the time, but they uh, said, everywhere we went, there were more libraries. <laughs> <laughs> libraries everywhere. And so I, it just struck me that there's probably no better place in the world to have a discussion about the future of uh, research libraries than Oxford. Uh, we're populated with them. The future of research libraries matters a great deal to us. Uh, and also, there's probably no other person I can think of that, is, um, you know, that we'd much rather have talk about this than the previous CEO or the <laughs> chief executive of the British Libraries. Uh, you know, they always say that when you retire from a position, that that's when you, you talk to the person. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it's really wonderful to have Dame Lynn Brindley here to speak about the future of uh, the research library. It's a, uh, not only had for over a decade of the uh, British Library, but um, most importantly, and it makes it even more appropriate for us. We didn't know this at the time uh, Lynn was invited, but uh, she'll be the new master of Pembroke College, and I believe uh, picking up that post in September or August. Or August. Mm -hmm. So uh, free for a while, and we've captured her <laughs> uh, to talk about a huge topic. Um, so we'll have, uh, Lynn will speak for uh, about 40 minutes or so, uh, and then we'll have two respondents. Uh, I think uh, Sarah Thomas will start, and then uh, <coughs> Christine Borgman will follow. Of course, Sarah Thomas, the, our Bodleian librarian, and Christine Borgman, who is uh, the uh, presidential chair at uh, UCLA, but we've captured her for a year as the Smithies uh, lecturer, uh, Oliver Smithies lecturer at Balliol College. And um, of course, uh, Sarah is a member of Balliol College as well. But uh, anyway, uh, delighted. For you. But then we'll have plenty of time for open discussion. And, and Lynn emphasized that she wants to begin a discussion here and doesn't uh, presume to end the end the end the uh, uh, the issues with us. So uh, may we welcome Lynn and thank you very much for coming. Uh, Bill, thank you very much for that welcome. I'm delighted to be here and to be able to contribute to this um, series. Um, I'm obviously going to sort of look back a little bit at my experience at the British Library, but also draw a bit on some of the current work that I'm involved in at Ofcom, the media and um, communications regulator. And uh, they do a lot of work on the changing use of technology and changing behaviors, which I think is relevant bit of technological context. I'm going to take a broad sweep, that is to say, I'm not going to say very much about anything and I'm going to leave out an awful lot because this is a huge topic I began to realize when I began to tackle it. But I genuinely think that, um, uh, I hope I say enough to enable you to begin a debate uh, and I, I, I think the spectrum of agreement to disagreement I hope will be very, uh, very um, strong uh, tonight. It's certainly a very, I think, uncertain uh, and certainly unmapped um, future. So I'm going to start. Um, first text message was sent um, in December 1992. It's now 21 years old this year. And according to Ofcom, the average UK consumer sends about 50 text messages every week. And 12 to 15 year olds, and I'm pulling out 12 to 15 year olds because they're the university students just about to, uh, to come. Um, and they're so sending an average of 193 texts each week, more than double this time last year. 
2011, 150 billion text messages were sent in the UK alone, almost three times the number sent in 2006. And people now prefer texting to speaking on the phone or face-to-face -face meetings. I felt that was a bit sad, actually, but um, nevertheless, those are the figures. But it does suggest, I think, a mild revolution in the way we are socializing and working and networking. Just a few more points about the 12 to 15 year olds. Um, they're prolific social networkers with lots of friends, um, average 286. And for the first time, they're spending as much time on the internet each week as they spend watching TV. And shock horror, they spend 17 hours a week on each. I thought that was a little, I thought there might be more on the internet, but 17 hours on the television as well, that's quite a lot. They're multitasking across media, texting, browsing the internet, and watching television simultaneously. So they're multitasking. They do everything online via mobile, and that's the device they'd say they'd miss more than anything else. Um, and 62% of them own one, and 17% of this age group also use tablets. I cross-checked that bill against some of the internet survey data, and it's it's consistent, I think. I don't think it's very different. There are two trends there, continuing increase in the proportion of users with portable devices and the increasing number of devices owned, multiple devices owned by individuals to access the internet. So I suppose I would say from that, um, the behavioral and the technological ecosystem within which the question of the future of the research library uh, has to be set, um, is one of pretty <coughs> massive, speedy, and continuous technological change. And I suppose all of these activities compete for attention um, in a world that sometimes can feel saturated with stuff we have to watch, listen to, uh, discuss, or review. <coughs> So what is it going to mean for established forms of engagement? I start, I think, with a hypothesis that these digital life habits, if I can call them them, will increasingly shape people's study and research habits and are going to be carried right into the expectations of universities, of teaching and learning, and of course of research library provision. I then want to just reflect a little bit about trust. Um, or rather the loss of it um, and the need to rebuild it. The banks are the most obvious case, but politicians, uh, the press and newspapers, given Leveson, um, even if you like public institutions such as the BBC, given the series of scandals that have happened, and Jimmy Savile and so on, and apparent cover-ups. Why do I raise that? What's it got to do with the future of research libraries? Well, well, maybe not much, but I think I ponder frequently that actually great libraries and libraries are trusted. The brand is trusted. Um, research libraries, Oxford, the British Library, Yale, Stanford, etc., are trusted by their users and their public. Their core values are built on that trust, on independence, integrity, longevity, and they are seen to work in the public interest. This seems to me to be a huge asset for the future. And the challenge, I think, for the research library is to retain and build on this trust, even though there's going to be a lot of disruptive change and less clarity of what, less certainty about what the role of a library is going to be. If you then move on to values and the purpose of libraries, when we was at, I was at the British Library, our purpose we encapsulated in the essence to advance the world's knowledge, standing on the shoulder of giants, all of these things, really embodied in that wonderful Paolozzi sculpture in the piazza um, of um, Newton. And the mission really accepts that knowledge builds on knowledge, knowledge advances knowledge, but the library itself doesn't take a position. The library is an evidential base for research activity, inquiry, and learning, and debate. 
Others have said the role of the library is around the cycle of creation and recreation. We're reminded too that the future of libraries and universities are inextricably linked. So research libraries do not have an intrinsic de destiny or future, but it's very much linked to the practices of scholars around them and the mission of the particular um, university. Others have introduced the idea of what's called the diffuse um, library. Libraries serving, as indeed is so evident here, the d diverse communities of scholars and disciplines, reinforcing the relationship between the research library and the parent institution, uh, and indeed the different kinds of missions depending on um, the way in which different universities are going to map very different futures. I think connected to the diffuse library idea, um, Wolfgang, who's here, I think. Wolfram. Wolfram, I'm sorry, Wolfram. Oh yes, sorry, Wolfram, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to call you the wrong name, sorry. Has argued here that research libraries are facing another risk, which is of drifting away from researchers and students a drift based on that requirement to serve multiple audiences and multiple communities. And I think he emphasized, which I think is a real challenge, always has been, but I think it's becoming even more of a challenge in relation to the different requirements of the different um, disciplines from natural scientist, computer scientist, right through to the arts and humanities scholar. One thing is very clear though, that one size is not going to fit all. There is not a single research library offering. And there'll be differentiation by discipline, by different user types, and by Duffy's um, mission. So I want to now to pull out five or six sort of themes, um, which I think are challenges um, as we move forward. It's very much a personal choice. Um, I could have chosen equally another six themes. Um, so um, I'll just get started and you can tell me about the ones I've missed out um, as I talk. Um, the first one is digital acquisition and digital archiving. Um, I guess some of us are rather pleased that after maybe a 20, 25 year campaign, the UK has eventually uh, just got a legal deposit law with regulations to enable um, legal deposit libraries to collect and preserve digital materials. You'll be able to capture them, preserve them, including websites, and essentially it means that there will not be a total black hole <coughs> in libraries of the memory of the 20th and 21st centuries. These are significant new long-term responsibilities with plenty of technical challenges, and they will be undertaken significantly in the public interest. Uh, they will not be, if you like, as an aside, happen to be done by the commercial sector. They will be done in the public interest. Now, what does all that mean? What's, uh, I think what it will pose are really n fundamental questions about what are you acquiring and collecting and why? So what is worth saving? What has got future value? Is that different from the analog world? Are snapshots of the web adequate for future historians? How deeply should we delve? How frequently and at what cost? I think we would be deluding ourselves if we, had, if we said we had answers to those questions at this point. Um, but pragmatically, most of the learning is going to take place as we, as we do these things, as we attempt this big new digital responsibility. Um, I think much of it will be in partnership with other libraries, also with other memory institutions. In the digital world, the distinction, I think, between an archive, a museum, a library, all but disappears. I'm careful how I say that, uh, but some of those distinctions disappear. And those will be partnerships as also with technologists and users across the globe. I think it also is not just the legal deposit libraries that have this responsibility. Every research library 
will have to um, think about the question. What is the new version of collecting personal papers, political papers, scientific papers? Um, what is the version of collecting unique records of contemporary culture and intellectual activity? And what should we collect, save, and why? Of course, now, a collection of papers are not papers. Um, they are essentially multimedia archives. Emails, tweets, YouTube clips, broadcasts, television, radio, blogs, personal websites. Already there are high-profile individuals who I know expect that their uh, records, their contribution will be, and memories will be dynamic, internet-based and multimedia focused. And if I just say Stephen Fry, Tim Berners-Lee, Boris Johnson, you may or may not want these people's papers, but you know that they are going to be something different from what libraries have had in the past. The historic concept that we've had of benign neglect, um, namely we can collect and preserve later, so perhaps served us reasonably well in the sort of papyrus uh, to print world, patché acid paper, will not suffice in the digital world if you think that the life of a website and average life may be 75 days. Um, that's probably reasonably long. Um, so thinking about collecting and preserving has to be done at the point of creation or the point of early harvesting. So co uh, contemporaneous ar archiving is necessary. You won't be able to sweep up after death and you won't just be delving in attics um, as a mode of operation. Partnerships with li living authors are now necessary. And we're seeing more and more examples of people, individuals, being their own living archive um, and recording instantaneously uh, the main events of their own lives. Um, uh, one example is um, prominent architect William McDonough, who's um, filming his meetings, recording his phone conversations, sending them in real time to Stanford, who is going to, who, who will put up that archive as a living um, archive on the, on the web. Life logging is another technique. And I guess it gets pretty close to a lot of individuals, if you go back to my 12 to 15 year olds, who are actually already wittingly and perhaps not so wittingly creating their own personal um, footprint, their personal digital archive um, already. So I think it raises a lot of new questions, uh, selective memories, digital death, authenticity of postings, how do you know it's real, independence of validation, all of these questions will come to the fore. <clears throat> the second topic I wanted to touch on was opening up legacy collections um, for global access. Now I think that's pretty well known territory, but research libraries have had and continue to have the obligation to open up um, their collections, their analog collections, their print collections, their manuscripts and so on, um, through digitization to open them up to the world. We know broadly now how to do it. Um, we know the scale of the resourcing. Um, and we know too that there's an increasing impatience if it's not accessible digitally then for some of our communities it might as well not be available because they're not, they are only wanting to engage with material they can find on the web. So there are many great examples of opening up through digitization, opening up treasures. If you take, for example, Trinity College Dublin, they've opened up the Book of Kells and they have exploited it in many ways, some of which you'll find tasteful and some not tasteful. Um, but they have a great app. Um, they have images to inspire designers. Um, they have Kells for Kids. Sorry about that. They have DVDs. And lest we forget, actually, they do provide opportunities for scholars and researchers to um, examine this text at very high resolution and compare and contrast, of course, with other related early illuminated manuscripts. But I think that's at the treasure's end. The other end 
is what I call industrial scale digitization. Um, and, you know, that is, um, well, in Oxford here, the Google Books, in the British Library, we digitize at scale newspapers, 40 million pages of them. And those often require a uh, scale of partnerships and resources that are really difficult to do without uh, massive external partnership funding. Um, but I guess my general point is that this has to be done, but it, difficult as it is, it's only a means to an end. And I think we've, we're getting through the phase that says, gosh, we've got to focus on digitization. We have to do that. But actually then it takes us into, for what purpose? And I think that opens up the new, newer area of the new value through digital scholarship. Um, and digital scholarship across the disciplines, but I think particularly perhaps of interest in the humanities and some of the social science work um, that enables text mining um, and analysis through uh, an addition of crowdsourcing and georeferencing of materials to take um, place. Um, and I think that is the next stage of why we're digitizing materials um, at this time. The third theme I just want to touch on, very different theme, is what I've called open access and copyright. Um, it used to be called the nerds versus the suits, which is not, not a bad shorthand, actually. I think that still partly applies. Um, because if I think about opening up um, legacy collections, most of us have only really focused on out of copyright material. There's been plenty of that to do. Um, the, the, there's not been as much done in the material that has rights challenges and complex copyright and permissions um, work. So the real future challenge is around balancing the IP and copyright protection uh, versus opening up and the whole push towards what I call the open movement, whether it's open, open access publication, open data, open innovation. And you know, that is a very, very live, contested, uh, and quite long journey, I think, in my uh, view. Um, and our aspiration, I think, as research libraries, must be that we can e ease, it can be easy um, to treat all relevant content as a fully searchable corpus. That has to be um, a goal. Now, in the past 12, 18 months or so, there have been a flurry of reports on open access publishing. I smile because the, the, actually the topic has been around uh, for a very long time. And, you know, I, I remember it well maybe 15 years ago. Um, so it's not been quick to come to the, to the forefront, but, but it's very interesting now that it's actually become a central public policy debate um, very quickly, not least because of Janet Finch's report and things like the Royal Society report on science as an open enterprise and another seminal report in the UK, which is the Hargreaves report on um, a review of intellectual property and copyright. Now the government has accepted all of these reports and clearly the open access publishing has, has generated much heat and debate uh, around some of the Research Council guidelines. Um, I think libraries have broadly always been um, in favor of moving towards the more open end of the spectrum open access scholarly publishing, b believing that it will remove price barriers and permission barriers um, that undermine widespread access to research literature and to, now to research data. And for new kinds of scholarship and research to take place without barriers, to be able to reuse, to manipulate in new ways and to really exploit some of the new research methods then this openness is essential. But the transition is very, very complex, hugely contested as these tectonic plates 
of traditional commercial interests collide with new business models and free options of the internet. And I put free in inverted commas because nothing is, of course, free. And of course, some of the um, unintended consequences in the short term and medium term are already being played out in some of the difficulties for learned societies that have emerged. And indeed, the lack, actually, of any of these models is serious scale yet for the future of the monograph um, in this new open world. Um, that takes me a little bit into big data. I'm cautious about getting into big data. And I know <laughs> that um, uh, one of our respondents is going to talk a bit more about that. Uh, um, and uh, so I'm not going to say very much. But I think essentially to say that data has become, not just for research purposes, but, but for commercial purposes, this source of new value, a top competitive asset, but driven primarily um, by the um, advertising in, in, and, and, and market value of the data um, that can be collected um, as a byproduct of much of our internet use. I mean, I don't know about you, I'm, I'm sort of mildly annoyed that Tesco knows my shopping habits mm -hmm. and sends me little uh, vouchers for even more goat's cheese or whatever <laughs> I'm eating a lot of. But it is really the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and I think it's pretty scary how much, without our permission, without a debate um, uh, about the data, um, we have not yet had that transparent and open dialogue between citizens, consumers, businesses, and government around that value exchange of personal data, anonymized data, attitudes to tracking, and so on. Now, a lot of that is consumer-oriented, but I think there is a version of it, it as we get much more into the data and text-driven research, uh, and it gets embedded in teaching and the research um, profile. There's also, I think, links to another point, which is around a, a, a more sophisticated digital skills, um, critical thinking agenda that I believe libraries have got to take a leading role in, in helping our communities um, understand uh, the complexity and the sophistication of what is happening around data. I think much of that role is educational and informative, um, yet libraries can't really claim to be opening up their collections, the legacy collections, uh, moving beyond the PDF, if you like, to ensure that that content is a searchable corpus without taking a concerted lead in all these debates and associated actions, and I would love to see that as a future role for research um, <coughs> libraries. I want to talk a little bit now about discovery navigation. Traditionally, heartland core of the research library function, primarily through bibliographic data and the catalog. But essentially now, we're seeing discovery and search belonging to and being primarily led by the big search engines, the big commercial players, Google, Amazon, Wikipedia, and others in that space. Facebook being an additional player as it develops the social search functions and facilities. And all of them, of course, taking advantage of hu huge amounts of personal information around the billions of users worldwide. Now, I think it's fine to embody the advertising and marketing interests and embed them in algorithmic design and research presentation if it was at all transparent. <laughs> but it's not. It's being manipulated. So my question for us, really, as a scholarly research community is much more about what is the adjunct to that? What is the role of libraries in countering um, some of that default activity 
um, of those commercial players. Clearly, users now turn as a first turn to these major network services. Of course they do. Time is short. Scale is the whole of the internet. Um, they don't really turn to that sort of small local collection first. And the question for the very long-term future, I think, is whether that, well, certainly that that material needs to be, uh, that metadata, the data generated by libraries, needs to be much more embedded in the, in the web environment um, and in multiple entry points across the web and aggregator services um, and becomes then a more uh, detailed and um, reliable source but within the broader framework. I've commented earlier on the increasing importance of web and mobile experiences um, actively uh, shaped by ranking, relating and recommending services uh, based on this sort of social and usage data. I think this is a major organizational challenge for libraries as supra-institutional approaches are required to generate the web scale. And that might be through consortia membership or through web presence well beyond the individual library or country. And I think it poses a big question for research libraries how these global collaborations um, and discovery services can be made to work um, for users. And have libraries got the right balance between focusing on the institutional finding tools and discovery tools versus the broader um, possibilities? Pulling perhaps in the other opposite direction come new demands for kite marking, for filtering, for helping to navigate ways through this deluge of information. Now, at one level, the filtering that social approaches and the use of analytics provide become more valuable. Ranking, relating, and recommending can help. I don't know about you, I'm still a real sucker for people like you have read when I go on to Amazon. Uh, or indeed, of course, in library catalogues now. Um, and I end up buying many, many books that I wouldn't other otherwise. <laughs> so it's a rather good marketing trick. Um, but there must be ways, I think, in which the traditional trust and authoritative mediation role played by libraries can be newly harvested in a range of different ways to stand at least as an adjunct um, beside the mighty commercial search engines. Um, some of you will know the Parker Point system for fine wines. Mm. <laughs> what, what, you know, there's a library version of that waiting to come out. Uh, not in a cottage industry kind of way, but in, a, in quite a um, sophisticated, um, trusted way that can be associated with um, the library brand. So the library role in authentication, in peer review processes, in navigation of the open research resources, expertly curated and interpreted subsets of coherent content is surely a core one for research libraries in the future and a way of adding value through the less is more approach. That, I think, tied with my point about critical thinking and assessment skills uh, in our student and research communities, um, I think, reach perhaps a new level in this new, uh, newer context. I'm going to touch now on something which you might wonder why. Um, it's partly because I'm interested, frankly, let's be clear, uh, on MOOCs. I'm sure you all know about these massive online open courses. Not an obvious theme for the future of research libraries given that MOOCs have essentially been thought about as routes into informal learning, outreach, and not perhaps part of formal higher education, um, or not as much. Um, maybe more for those who haven't got time to attend traditional universities or may not be necessarily interested in course accreditation. However, I think what's very interesting to observe is that the predominant leadership of MOOCs has come from prestigious research universities, Harvard, Stanford, MIT, 
and others, and I observe not Oxbridge. Um, key question for me is around what role and distinctive contribution a research library in those settings can make to these new developments. I mean, there are obvious roles for libraries, um, and if you know what the OU does, you know, they do these roles. So negotiations with publishers to clear materials, fair use, fair dealing decisions, tracking down public domain materials, providing digital production services, sourcing open access materials, and so on. These are sort of obvious. The question for the research libraries, you know, what are the more creative ideas? Where can real value be added by you know, the richness of the research library? One or two of these ideas are beginning to emerge, um, becoming domain participants and facilitators of online communities, organizing and making sense of user-generated content, mass-scale curation. Perhaps most importantly, though, I think, again, I come back to the research and critical thinking skills in the many publics of a globally accessible MOOC. And I think if you tie that, too, back to the obligation of research libraries to provide much richer content online. How you embed that in the MOOC's context, I think, is important. Um, so a real question um, for research libraries in those universities that choose to engage in this way. Because I think what's obvious is a MOOC, well, I, it's obvious to me, it may be controversial, but I think a MOOC offered for informal and external users will challenge people to rethink how offerings are made on campuses um, as well um, for, for traditional university students. My final theme concerns the question of what is the future of the physical library? Um, many have rather simplistically said, oh, it's all digital. Actually, it's usually when they've been trying to refuse government ministers trying to say you don't need any more money for buildings um, or increased storage. You know, what's the point? It's all digital and the physical library no longer has a role in the digitally connected world. But in my view and my experience, I, uh, frankly, nothing can be further from the truth. Uh, the challenge I think it does pose to us, though, is to develop and articulate a new vision of the distinctive role of the physical library in the new context. Uh, I know from experience at the British Library, a sense of place in the digital world is very important. Space for exchange of ideas, for collaborative working, public discourse, silence and concentration, and somewhere where discussion around research interests can take place. Camaraderie, community, and solidarity of experience amongst library users was evident on a daily basis in the BL building and around the reading rooms. So I think whilst digital companionship is important, it doesn't appear to be in any way sufficient. I think a linked question to that is, what is the changing relationship between the artifact, the original, the primary source material, the digital surrogate, and the physical space, that triangulation. If we're digitizing our treasures, our poems, our documents, our letters, our rare books, um, we'll have some experience of that. I mean, from my observation, the more you digitize, the more interest it actually generates in use of the primary uh, material or from a visitor perspective, people wanting to come and see it. But I'm not aware that there is a huge amount of research yet done on what that changing relationship was. Some of you may know more about it than, than me, but that seems to be a very, very critical topic. Again, one in which the research libraries, I think, could play a leading role in trying to get um, some of the funding bodies to look at this or grants towards it. So uh, let me try to just draw one or two points um, together, um, uh, which I hope might lead into uh, to help some of the discussion. There are some obvious things. I mean, the future of the research library is clearly tied in to the way in which the parent institution sees its future. And that's 
self-evident and obvious. The research library is not going to be one size fits all. That requires, I think, very um, quite brave leadership to be different. Um, and I think that's essential. Because I think in the post-print world, there will be many more differentiated services. I think p possible fragmentation, where domain and discipline um, uh, expertise may, may or may not exist in the library, or may not exist in enough depth, and even some withdrawal from local provision, where it's better provided perhaps on uh, an international, national or shared scale. I think there will be tensions between this very, very deep specialization and the huge breadth of the research library. And you know, what is going to give, or how is that balance going to be played out? Technological drivers, I'd stick my neck out and say um, those will not determine what happens. But I do think the behavioral changes associated with all of those technologies um, will, I think, be the areas to study, which is why I did start on, I mean, Ofcom also tracks three-year-olds <laughs> onwards tracks right through to mid-twenties, but the 12 to 15 are really changing very, very fast. Um, so I think that whole behavioral change is really, really important. And then working at network scale, what I call, you know, working at that global internet scale, what does that mean? What are the alliances? What are the right collaborations? Will be absolutely central questions for research libraries. And then I think the nerds versus the suits, if I can use that label, resurrected, um, uh, to just simply encapsulate what I think will be um, uh, a tension for, for, for a very, very long time um, to come. And how do we best support scholarship um, in that creative sort of chaos and very, very long transition? So I think I would like to stop there. The only thing I would conclude, really, is that it's not an option to stand still um, because everything else is changing. You've either got to choose a path through this, or I think there's the threat, or maybe to some it might be the right answer, but I don't think for anybody here you know, to become the museum of the book. We have to be very, very different. Thank you.